Good evening. Yeah, I'm really honoured to introduce our speaker today, Professor Benjamin Horton, a true luminary in the field of sea level science. As the director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore and AXA Nanyang Professor in Natural Hazards, Professor Horton has dedicated his illustrious career to unraveling the complexities of sea level rise. His expertise transcends the confines of academia, extending into a real-world applications as a professor at the ASEAN School of Environment. Professor Horton has been at the forefront of global initiatives, most notably leading the COP26 report on managing disaster risk from natural hazards in ASEAN. But what truly sets Professor Horton apart is his unwavering commitment to the cause. His groundbreaking research has earned recognitions from the highest levels, even being cited by former President Obama in his 2015 State of the Union address. Today, we are very fortunate to have Professor Horton here, revealing the challenges ahead and the urgent need for collective action. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm and enthusiastic welcome to Professor Benjamin Horton. Professor, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Ben Horton. I'm director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore here at NTU. The Earth Observatory of Singapore is a world-class research center and it quite simply saves lives. So I was sat at the front. What was I doing at the front? I was looking at our response to the tragic events in Morocco. So we heard about the earthquake that occurred on Friday night. So the World Food Program, the United Nations, contacts EOS, and they ask EOS to produce the disaster maps that the aid agencies will use to save people. That's what EOS does. And I don't think many people really know that at NTU, that we have a team of people, young Singaporeans generally in that team, it's a team of eight people, uh, six of them are Singaporeans. They work 24 seven when a disaster happens and the pressure on their job blows my mind because if they get their maps wrong, then the aid agencies don't go to a particular house that has been flattened where people are desperate for aid. But that's what we do. That's what we're trying to do right now. It's all about the day, of, a day in a life of being a director. What else am I doing right now? Well, on Wednesday night, we've got our 15th year anniversary of EOS. Okay, so it's a big landmark. Um, you know, Singapore's only 60 years old. This university is only 30 years old, and EOS is a huge footprint, 15 years old. So we've got um, Minister Grace Fu is coming to the event, um, and we're trying to deal with the agenda. She's like, and it's so detailed, it slightly blows my mind. They want to move forward by 15 minutes, the first course of the, <laughs> and I'm just going like, I don't care about this, do what the hell you want. Okay, so that was, that's what I'm doing right now, as well as responding to the Moroccan earthquake. What did I do this morning? Well, I was on Hong Kong radio. So what happened last week to do with climate change was that in um, Hong Kong, they had a one in 500 year event where they had historic, um, where they had historic rainfall which flooded the cities of Hong Kong. So I was asked to appear on the national radio um, and talk about this event. And what I wanted to talk about was, well, it wasn't a one in 500 year event, obviously. It may not have occurred in the observational record, but to state it's a one in 500 year event is just misleading the population. Yes, it broke all records, but it will occur again and again and again. We are living with climate change right now. Um, every impact that we see, rainfall, heat waves, wildfires, droughts, does not surprise me in the slightest. When I was your age, 
30 or so years ago, I sat in undergraduate lectures where a scientist such as myself said, well, if we don't do anything about climate change, within 30 years, there will be record-breaking temperatures and droughts and heats and wildfires. There'll be record-breaking rainfall and flooding, and people will lose their lives. And I sat there going like, oh, that's a problem. Yeah? But we're going to solve it because all the leaders at that time in the early 90s came together in the Kyoto Protocol and they were going to solve it. Now I'm talking to you about the reality of climate change and there's nothing we can do about it now. It's locked in. Do not any one of you think we're going to go back to a stable climate the heat waves, droughts, flooding and landslide that we've seen in 2023, it will only get worse next year, in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 20... It's the reality now. And what... Okay, so the events don't surprise me, but the lack of resilience blows my mind. It doesn't matter whether you're in a developed or a developing country. We cannot handle Mother Earth. You imagine being in a family in Hawaii. You've got a raging wildfire at your back, and you've got ocean waves crashing on a cliff line structure of wave heights of 5 to 10 meters. And because those wildfires are so bad, you jump off into the water with your family. That was your choice because the Hawaiian state was not prepared for wildfires that every scientist could predict. It's not good, guys. It's really not. You're going to have to live through this. I'm going to have to live through this. Climate change isn't about future generations. It's about you and what's going to happen to you. Here in Singapore, okay, so I didn't really know what I was going to talk about today in the slightest. Okay, I have some slides, but then I just always just stand up and I sort of like get on a soapbox on whatever's in the back of my mind. Okay, so back in 2019, I wrote an article in the Straits Times stating that record temperatures would be broken in Singapore the next time there's an El Nino. Now, I'm not some soothsayer, I can't predict very much. You know, I'm a massive Manchester United fan. Maybe I can predict that they're not going to win the league this year. They're, they're not going to win the league in five years' time. Climate change is incredibly complex, but at certain cases, it's really simple. So I made that projection in 19, or made that statement in the Straits Times in 2019, and then I repeated it earlier this year. How can I be so sure that we all break temperatures, which we did on May the 12th, 2023? We had record-breaking temperatures in Singapore. Was that publicised in the media? To some degree. But at that point, we had a bigger disaster occurring. We could not get Taylor Swift tickets. That was the big headline in social media. We can't get hold of Taylor Swift tickets. Whereas it really should have been that on May the 12th, 2023, was the warmest temperature, just looking at your demographics, that any of you have ever experienced in Singapore for the whole of your natural life. What I would say is it's going to be one of your coolest days when you move into the future. So I, why did I predict that? Well, as I said, I'm no rocket scientist here. I'm quite good at my job. I'm not a bad scientist, very good at administration. I'm actually quite organized. I think that's what sets me apart. Um, I care about people. Um, you know, I have a tattoo on my back which represents equality. It's my big driving factor in life. Um, but climate change sometimes isn't complicated. Because when you think about climate change and heat stress, what you need to know is just some simple things. What's the warmest time of the day? 
Okay? Everyone in here knows that, well, it's not 6 a.m., it's not 6 p.m., it's sometime between around midday and 4 p.m. So that's the first thing you work out. Then you have to think about, well, for Singapore, what's the warmest time of the year? So if you look through temperature records, it relates to monsoon variability. So the warmest time in the year is between around April and June. Okay, so we know that. So, right, okay, sometime between April and June. In the mid-afternoon, you're going to get really hot temperatures. Then you need to know what's the warmest time in a decade. And here in Southeast Asia, we have natural climate variability that's related to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is an atmosphere-ocean interaction. It controls the heat of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and therefore the atmosphere above it. We had been in a La Nina phase suppressing global temperatures, suppressing temperatures in Singapore for the previous four years, we were then going to flip into the warm phase, which is known as El Nino. Scientists said it was going to happen this year, and that was always my bigger worry. So you've got the warmest times in the day, the warmest times in the year, and the warmest times in the decade. And then they all overline the baseline, which is climate change. The last major El Nino that we had here in Singapore and Southeast Asia was in 1982. It caused amazing wildfires, drought, heat waves, decimated rice production, hindered water availability, particularly in developing nations. Between 1982 and 2023, we have had 40 years of climate change. We have more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere now than we've had for three million years. The temperatures that we have in 2023 perhaps have not been seen for around 120,000 years, when the Earth was slightly warmer than today. So that's my big worry. 1982 was devastating here in Southeast Asia. Now you've got 40 years of climate change. Singapore's temperature has risen about 2 to 3 degrees C in those 40 years. So you superimpose that on a major El Nino. You superimpose that on monsoon variability. You superimpose that on the warmest time of the day. And this time next year, people are going to die in Singapore. Simple as that. That's climate change. That's the reality. That's what you have to live with. And we have to hope that I'm wrong. We really have to hope that I'm completely wrong. That El Nino doesn't materialize. It's a small blip. It's not a major El Nino. I'm exceedingly worried because the temperature rises in the Pacific Ocean have never been seen before. The rate of rise that we see in the Pacific right now has never been seen before. We've been collecting measurements for 50 or so years, since the year of the ocean in 1956. Okay? So we've been collecting these measurements and we've never seen that rate of warming. So that then, again, you don't need to be a rocket scientist if the Pacific's warming up that much, you get worried that you're going to have the next major El Nino. But I hope I'm wrong. I really do, because the unfortunate thing is that if we do have a major El Nino, it will be the elderly, the young, the infirm that will suffer, those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And I spend all my time all my time trying to get this message across. It is very urgent that we act. It's very urgent that we become more resilient. And we need to be informed and education. So why I was asked to do this um, talk, I mean, why did I say yes and it, uh, um, immediately, is because I try to reach out beyond people I would normally talk to. I run undergraduate classes, and so this is an opportunity for me to talk beyond, um, beyond environmental sciences, across the College of Sciences, across, um, ed, uh, across um, the undergraduate curriculum here at um, NTU. So there we go. I could actually stop right now and then ask you to ask me some questions but I'm going to go through this slide deck because what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about what a US is I mean you know 
when you're growing up as, um, you know, you know my, my career history, you know, I did my PhD at Durham University in the UK, which was uh, at the time, and still is, was a centre for sea level research. So if you were a, a budding undergraduate that wanted to do a PhD um, um, in climate change stroke sea level rise, you went to Durham University. They had this big thematic funded programme. And so I was at Durham University for a while, um, and then I moved to the United States, um, and I was an assistant, an associate, and full professor. But in your career, there are always jobs that really attract you. You know, when I was younger, oh, what did I want to do? I wanted to play for Manchester United or be an astronaut. One of the two, failed at both of those. When I was an academic, when, when I started in academia, I wanted to work at the Natural History Museum. What a building, you know, and I managed to spend some time there. Then I wanted to go and work in Australia, did a little bit of internship over in Australia. But then when I heard about the Earth Observatory of Singapore, it was always my dream job to work with them because they're very special, the scientists, the staff and the students. They have to try and address the most hazardous region on the planet, and that's what this map is trying to show you. Okay, so areas in red are all the seismic or tectonic hazards. Three of the largest 12 ever earthquakes recorded occurred on this map. So the Moroccan event that's just happened, about magnitude 6.8, in 2004, the Sumatran megathrust ruptured with a magnitude around 9.3, 9.4, a huge event that um, devastated South and Southeast Asia, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Volcanoes. So the yellow triangles represent volcanoes. There are 900 active volcanoes around Singapore. Within these, two active within these 900 active volcanoes are the two largest eruptions that have occurred in the last thousand years. Krakatoa, Tambora, devastating effects. The only recorded volcanic eruptions in the last thousand years that reach explosivity six. Tropical cyclone tracks. Tropical cyclones with climate change are going to change in their frequency, intensity, strength, and duration. The two largest land-falling tropical cyclones ever recorded in human history occur on this map. Typhoon Tip in 1979 and Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. And then sea level rise. What I was brought in the country to do Basically, what I was asked to do, I was headhunted um, by this university and headhunted by the Singaporean government to address sea level rise. Because Singapore is an island nation. Only a third of Singapore is, above, is one metre above the highest tides. And in Southeast Asia, it doesn't get any better. All the areas in blue are these low elevation coastal zones. It's anticipated by the end of this century that one billion people will be influenced by sea level rise. 70% of them are on this map. So when you come and work at EOS, you're trying to save lives because they desperately need it. And we at EOS know we have a responsibility to do this. We work for NTU one of the world's leading universities. I always wonder whether you get that. It's not surprising if you don't, but when you've become as mature as I have and been around countless universities, you realize how special NTU is. It's a top 20 university. It has a huge responsibility to take that scientific knowledge and save people's lives. And I'm director of EOS, and I couldn't be more proud. So sea level rise. 
Sea level rise has an existential threat. So in the introduction, it was stated that, uh, you know, President Obama cited me. He did. He cited me in, in the State of the Union address in 2015. So that's, you know, a president in the United States gives one major speech to Congress per year. It's his State of the Union. He delivered it in 2015, and he was talking about climate change and instead of citing NASA or NOAA, he cited our research group and something that we came up with where we stated that sea level rise was rising faster in the 20th century at any time in the previous 2,000 years. So it's quite a groundbreaking discovery. When you're thinking about climate change, it's all about whether we're living in an unusual time. And we can see that in temperature quite easily, but no one could decipher it to do with sea level. Are the rates that we record in tide gauges such as Marina Bay, are they unusual? Have they ever been seen before? And we could conclusively show that they weren't. And so President Obama said this, and if you were watching C-SPAN, it then split the screen and showed our publication. It's quite an interesting thing when you get the President of the United States citing your work, and so it's an incredible honor for myself and my family, you know, great for the university, but the blowback on it from the conservative religious right was pretty horrendous. So straight after that, Breitbart News the following morning had a headline on their website saying that Professor Horton is a psychopath. That was the headline, okay? But Bannon, Bannon is not a nice individual. He really isn't. He knows what he's doing. So he, he goes through, some, like, basically trying to trash my science. I don't mind that because I can handle that. What I never could handle is the fact that he put my home address on that website. That's not funny. That's not funny. What happens if your home address is on the website? In the U.S.? Do you want to know how many death threats I got? Do you know how many handwritten letters I got through my door? That is what the right will do. It's not great. So, getting an accolade from President Obama, absolutely fantastic. I, it's on my website. I mean, you know, I'm a big Democrat, you know, big Labour supporter, all those type of things. But it caused a lot of issues. The first author on the paper was a graduate student of mine. The amount of political blowback on him, he left academia. He went, I'm not in it for this. That isn't what I want to study science and discover things. And he was saying to me, do you think I lied? Do you think, no, do you think I wanted to, I would have loved to have found that sea levels weren't the fastest that they were in 2000 to keep people safe. He left our academia, went to work for KPMG. This is a big problem. Crikey. Again, not, not very obvious. You warm up global temperatures, you dry out soil. You put more water vapor in the atmosphere, you get more thunderstorms and lightning attacks. Okay? Put those two together, the world is going to burn. European Union in 2023 had the largest ever recorded fire in Greece, the European bloc. Canada had such extensive wildfires that the cities of New York, DC, Baltimore and Detroit had the worst air pollution on the entire planet. And we've already, di already discussed um, We've already discussed Hawaii. Again, what did EUS do to do with all of this? So the Hawaiian wildfires. Who was tasked with mapping the fires in Hawaii? Was it the US government and FEMA? Or was it EOS at NTU? It was the latter. That's what we do. We try to keep people safe. What are we doing? Well, one of the big worries here in Singapore, I mean, um, is the last time we had an El Nino in Singapore, it's one of the things that I've always been worried about. It was a minor El Nino. It was in 2015 and 16, and we had horrendous haze here in this country because the drying of the forest 
floor and the ignition, either anthropogenically by humans or naturally through lightning, caused a lot of forest fires in the palm oil areas of Sumatra. The prevailing wind takes that particulate matter here into Singapore. So it, again, look at an analogy of the past, we can be very, very concerned that there are going to be further forest fires. And we've already been tasked by the Ministry of Defence to monitor forest fires in Sumatra. Some of them are beginning to start. We're trying to provide them in sort of real-time information. This isn't just EOS. It also involves um, NUS. Um, they have a satellite remote sensing group known as CRISP. So it's all about giving the information to local authorities so they can try and suppress the burns. One of the things that EOS is doing right now is that we're trying to also couple together our knowledge of forest fires with coupling together with real-time information on air pollution in Singapore. So we have an associate professor that was recently hired called Steve Yim and his methodology is to use ground-based radar to basically monitor particulate matter as it comes into Singapore. So for the first time, for the first time, we'll be able to provide real-time warning to Singaporeans when they can or when they cannot be outside because of the air pollution. Again, that's what we do. Volcanic eruptions. Well, one of the things, that, again, what does EOS do on this? So when EOS was formed, it was all about a lack of knowledge on these volcanoes in Southeast Asia. They have incredible potential at influencing lives locally and regionally. So EOS holds the global database for volcanic eruptions. So every eruption anywhere in the world comes into EOS, we process that data, and then we let the scientific community use it. Obviously, our scientists have the first attempt at this. We also have instrumentation on three of the most active and most destructive potentially volcanoes in Southeast Asia, ones that overlook Jakarta, ones that overlook um, um, Manila. We then also have a variety of monitoring stations in eight different countries around Southeast Asia, which monitor how the Earth moves to do with earthquakes, any changes in gas content to do with volcanoes, and also measure if they're near the oceans, the ocean surface. This imagery, this is the Turkey-Syria earthquake. I like, well, I don't like saying this at all, but what am I, I'm just going to repeat myself. Who was tasked to map this disaster? Was it NASA? Was it the European Space Agency? Was it the Japanese Space Agency? Or was it EOS? So EOS mapped the Syria-Turkey earthquake. Again, tasked by the United Nations. We produced these maps. We were the first um, scientific body to produce a map. It then was provided to all the aid agencies to go to the buildings that are destroyed and not go to the buildings that are, that are stood still. Just imagine that responsibility Talk about making a difference. That's what some of the young scientists do at the Earth Observatory. Tropical cyclones. Again, um, not rocket science. You know, if you're going to, our oceans are warmer now than they've been through observational history of the last 150 years. If you've got a warm ocean, it provides the energy for our tropical cyclones whether you call them typhoons in Asia or hurricanes on the East Coast. You've got more energy in the ocean, what's going to happen? You're going to increase your frequency, increase your intensity. Other things that we've discovered is that the hurricanes, typhoons, tropical cyclones move at a slower speed. Now, that's really bad news because then they can settle on a coastline and just pound it again and again with rainfall and storm surges. So we did some work, I mean, you know, sort of stuff that I've been involved in very, very actively. 
when I was in the US, I mean, I've, I've experienced quite a few natural disasters. They're not good, obviously. I was in the US when Hurricane Sandy barreled into New York City and New Jersey in 2012. It was a horrific event. Hundreds of lives were lost, thousands of people were left homeless, caused 70 or so billion dollars damage in Manhattan alone. So as a scientist, what I wanted to do was, let's say, well, how did climate change influence that event? Because there have been hurricanes before. So we did some work, we modeled the hurricanes, we looked at observational records, and we stated that Hurricane Sandy without climate change was a one in 500 year event. In 2012, with climate change, it was a one in 50 year event. If you allow climate change to take its course, within 30 years, it will be a one in five year event. And by around 2070, it will be an annual event. That's climate change again. Something that without it was once every seven generations. Something with it, within 50 years, will be an annual event. New York City cannot withstand it. New York City, perhaps the cultural center of the whole of planet Earth, will not exist. That's the reality of climate change. But for Singapore, Singapore doesn't suffer from tropical cyclones. Um, Singapore doesn't suffer from, will not suffer from wildfires, although the region will. But this is the problem, Antarctica. So, you know, I'm a sea level scientist, uh, so I basically involve looking at sea, how sea levels change in the past, present, and future, but the big process that drives it is Antarctica. So, and I'd never been. Um, so, I put together a team um, earlier this year, and we went to Antarctica. Um, this team uh, were sponsored by the government to do this. Uh, who else were we sponsored by? Well, we tried to make this um, an all-female team. So then we got sponsorship from Chanel, you know, the handbag company. Uh, we got sponsorship from a philanthropic society called Her Earth. To try and, and so we had uh, uh, female staff from, or female scientists from the Philippines, from Singapore, from the US, and from Australia. That was the team that we put together. Now, for Singapore, we put the first ever Singaporean to make landfall on Antarctica as a scientist. That had never been done in the history of Singapore. The first Brit to set foot on Antarctica is Shackleton. Go on Netflix and read about that. The first Singaporean in February of this year was Fangi Tan, ASE undergraduate, ASE EOS graduate. That's what you can do at NTU. It would have never been imagined 60 years ago that Singapore would be leading a scientific mission to Antarctica. We did it earlier this year. So EOS is broken up into these series of um, knowledge clusters and themes. We work very heavily here in Singapore as well. I mean, so we stretch our, our research expertise from Antarctica to the Arctic, looking at earthquakes and volcanoes, but, you know, we're funded by the government. So we do work on air quality, water quality here in Singapore. We try to look for solutions or risks, geothermal energy, nature-based solutions. Try to keep this, re this, this country safe and sustainable. We're 15 years old. But we've done a lot of firsts. We had, um, so the Asian School of the Environment was first of all created as earth science. I always think EOS is, like I always, like my predecessor, who was the first director of EOS, Kerry Z, had great vision, as did the government. Um, when I met him, I met the Deputy Prime Minister um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said to me, 
Wasn't it a good idea to start EOS all those years ago? Because it's so needed right now. Because when EOS was started, your high school education, so a lot of you here, your high school education was because of EOS. So any, your curriculum was completely changed by EOS. So for the first time, high school kids here in Singapore were taught about how the earth works, were talked about sustainability, taught about climate change, talked about earthquakes and volcanoes and subduction zones. That's what we did because we saw that we had to develop the high school educations to then create a new body of people that would want to do undergraduate work in how the earth works. So we created, in 2010, Earth Sciences, which then became the Asian School of the Environment. We had our first cohort come in in 2014, and they graduated in 17, 18, and 19. So, you know, they're all these first. So for the first time here in Singapore, you now have a body of students that are graduating. I know you, a lot of you are taking cross-curriculum in sustainability, but there are a group of students that spend their four years studying the earth, and that wasn't there before EOS started. One of our charges as... Um, as EOS, is to develop this capacity. So, you know, like, whenever you start a research centre, you have some fundamental science that you want to do. I've talked a little bit about that we think we're, we do something more because our work is so important to save lives, but the other thing is to create the capacity. I have a boss. I have two bosses, in actual fact. I have, like, a boss at NTU, um, who's uh, Professor Lu Kong, who's the VPR, but I also have a boss on my governing board, who's Jakob Ibrahim, who used to be Minister for Ministry of Sustainability and Environment, and he says the ultimate ambition of EOS is for me to be replaced and a Singaporean stand here talking about. So he's always talking about me losing my job, like all the time, whenever we meet anybody. Yeah, he's going to go soon. I'm always like, whoa, 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 not, not yet. But this is our plan. The first ever graduate student in earth and climate science in Singapore was in 2010. And so our numbers are increasing. We've got, we're starting a new program where we've got 29 PhD students studying climate science. So this number is going to skyrocket. We try and get the best around the world, and we're able to, which really helps with diversity and inclusivity here in Singapore. We try to lift people up in Southeast Asia. We're, we very know, I mean, you know, it's about responsibility. We know that Singapore's invested so much in higher education that our co surrounding nations don't have that fortune. So we try to lift these people up. They come to Singapore. We pay for their training for four or five years doing their PhD. Then they can go back and be parts of leaders in those programs. So if we go to Indonesia and we go to their Academy of Scientists known as BRIC, you know, you look around, oh yeah, there's an EOS graduate student. You go to the Philippines and you look at their agency studying earthquakes and volcanoes, go, oh yeah, there's another EOS graduate student. We will have a long-lasting impact on the region, and then obviously here in Singapore. We want to create the next director, but more importantly, we want our graduate students to fill in gaps that exist um, So we have a variety of different funding programs. How long do I have left? Is someone going to tell me? How many? 15. 15. All right, okay. So we have a variety of different funding programs here um, at EOS. So we're always, so we're like, um, we've been funded traditionally by the government. Um, sort of what's called block funding, where they basically say, right, well, what's your, what, what's your expenses this year? And then we'll say, right, well, we've got this number of administrators, graduate students, postdocs, and they will give us an amount of money to keep us operational. The other thing that we do is try to get external funding from the Ministry of Education. So we have a variety of programs. We have Invest. So this is what is known as an MOE Tier 3B. It's around a $20 million program. 
We are currently trying to find graduate students and postdocs to work on this. And really, it's about looking at big data, using AI. Can we make breakthroughs in understanding where the next large earthquake or volcano is going to occur? How large is it going to be? And when will it likely occur? So looking at recurrence intervals. This is the new program. It's going to be officially announced on Wednesday. So this is called an MOE Tier 3 C. So it's bigger than a B. Uh, it's a C. It involves, it's led by EOS. It involves all colleges and schools from the Business School, College of Engineering, Wiccan Wee School of Communication, Arts, Design and Media, and obviously EOS. This is a $50 million program. We are currently, once it's announced, we're going to be looking for 28 PhD students. All of those PhD students will be unique. Um, they, in many ways, but one of the things is that we have funding within this program to either place a student internationally, so the student can go and work in an international lab to get the latest information on climate or can work within business. So we have a variety of partners. I've already mentioned one of the graduate students will work with Chanel. They'll get a handbag, they'll get perfume, a luxury watch. Now, they won't get any of that. I will. No, I won't get any of that. But they will work in a multinational company. A company that has... Like a, Chanel are quite interesting. We have a lot of companies that come to see us. And so Chanel came to see us and said, like, you know, a lot of companies, it's all this element of greenwashing. A lot of companies would like the EOS stamp on them so they can say they're doing something for the environment. And most of the time we just bat them away. We're not particularly very interested. But with Chanel... They came to us and said, look, you know, we don't want to, like the graduate student's not going to be named by Chanel. They just wanted our help in twofold, upstream and downstream. They said to me, look, we were a, a world leading luxury good manufacturer at the beginning of the 20th century. We want to be the same at the beginning of the 22nd century. Can you help us diversify our supply chain? So I spoke to Nanyang Business School and I said, look, hey, can you work on this? And the professor there said to me, he said, um, he said, we can only work on this if they're fully transparent with their data. So we went back to them and said, you've got to give us all, our all your data. And so then they agreed with that. The next thing is that they wanted to do something downstream, and they want to support women in science. So, for example, they sponsored our trip to Antarctica, and they're sponsoring a lot of other things regarding women in science in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So we have a lot of opportunities here. We're after about 30 graduate students and about 45 um, postdocs. It's going to be huge. Uh, it blows my mind. I, administratively, I don't really know how we'll pull it off, but that's not my problem. Okay. Then what I'm going to talk to you about for the last 10 minutes is this program, um, which is, you know, why I came to Singapore. So I, I came to Singapore for a variety of reasons. You know, I wanted to experience Asia. I wanted to come to this world-class university. But I had, a, like, a, a, a driving um, sort of mission in my life. I'd spent, I'd spent 25 years studying sea level, and I wanted to create something create something that would be a sort of like a, a science centre, a world-class science centre. I wanted to create something that was interdisciplinary, and I wanted to create something that would make a difference. That's what I was after. And so I came here to Singapore to do that. I had a method that I thought would work um, based around my background, I mean, I'm quite an interdisciplinary scientist. You know, I did my PhD in a geography department, so I was exposed to social and physical geography. I know geography is very strong here in Singapore, and it is in the United Kingdom. I went to the US, worked in an earth science department and an environmental science department, moved to Rutgers University, um, worked in a marine science department, came back, came here to Singapore, was chair of the Asian School of Environment. So I'm quite, I'm quite multi, multidisciplinary, and sea level has that element of trying to understand it. And I wanted to try and make a difference. So when I came here... 
In contrast to the US, where there's still the denial of climate change, there is a lack of urgency in Singapore, and those still exist. Things are changing, but, you know, like on the Republican debate a few weeks ago, climate change was brought up, and that's a win. Previous Republican debates, climate change would have never been brought up. But still, when it was brought up, people denied it, quoted as being a hoax. Here in Singapore... There's the acceptance of science. There's the, you know, there is the, um, the knowledge that experts are good for a nation. You know, Grove in the UK, who was Deputy Prime Minister, said you need less experts. And he's Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom on public TV saying that experts are the problem. Here, with experts are valued, but there's a lack of urgency, and there still is. I still haven't achieved my mission of actually making a difference. I've had an amazing scientific career. I mean, I really have. You know, PhD students who write great papers, bringing in research grants, you know, being a full professor at 40, running EOS, but on making a difference in policy, I am an abject failure really am. I worked in North Carolina a lot of the time in the US. By the time I'd stopped working there, they banned sea level rise. In all their um, state legislature, from where you can build and where you can't, they banned it. They had a better plan before I started working there. Hurricane Sandy hits the United States. I get to meet Chris Christie, who's the governor of New Jersey, and I say, look, here's his plan. You can make this area more sustainable, save people's lives. And he threw me out of his office within about 10 minutes, said, I can't do this because it has Climate change, for some unknown reason, doesn't influence Republicans. You know, when an iceberg melts, it melts. It doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican. It melts and sea level rises. In Singapore, we've made some changes. The Prime Minister had a National Day rally um, where he mentioned sea level rise. But you've just had an election. You've just had an election for um, your president. Was climate change discussed once? Was it discussed once? No. So I failed. I've been here five and a half years. I've done so many Straits Times editorials, so much time on the TV. I'm quite a passionate speaker. I was at the Arts and Science on Saturday again, trying to talk about climate change. I've failed. So I came here to do this program. You know, it involves all these professors we join together, but are we going to make the difference? PUB have just started a centre of excellence, you may have read about it in the news, a centre of excellence on um, coastal adaptation. Okay? Fantastic. I spoke about this on Hong Kong radio, saying like, oh, this is great that they're doing that. But it's a centre of excellence. I know what it's like to run a centre of excellence. You do things that are groundbreaking. Okay? You make the difference. You're the ones who are mapping the Moroccan earthquake. Will that area, will the centre of excellence from PB? I don't know how they're going to handle it. In engineering, in response to sea level rise, how do you handle uncertainty? I don't know how you handle it. There are engineers in there. I saw the list of students. There are engineers here. How do you handle uncertainty? An uncertainty that could be classified as ambiguity or in our terms is handled as deep uncertainty. We do not know the probability distribution of it. We just know that there are processes that have occurred in the past that cause dramatic changes in sea level, but we can't predict them. How do you handle that? I don't know. One of my graduate students went to the opening event, because I can see her, and I wanted Christabel to ask at that opening event, how do you handle deep uncertainty? Because that's where Singapore can get ahead or cannot. Um, what do we do in this program? And then I'm going to finish. What have we done so far? I mean, some of the stuff. I mean, you know, like, so climate change can be a little bit doom and gloom, obviously. 
But, you know, people who know me, I think they quite like to hang out with me. I mean, I see a couple of them but out there, and we're like tomorrow... Tomorrow night we're going playing football and then we'll have some drinks afterwards. They do actually invite me along to these events. I don't sit there and preach doom and gloom about climate change because although I have great despair at what's happening to the planet, I'm also surrounded by all these amazing young minds. Cheryl Tay, 20, in her mid-twenties, Singaporean, produce something that no one on planet Earth had ever done. Okay, so when sea level rise, sea level rise is um, basically got three sides of a triangle to solve. One side is how much the ice sheets are melting. And there are global organizations led by NSF, um, previously the Russian academies, that are trying to understand what Antarctica and Greenland are doing. The second side of the triangle are the oceans. How much are they warming up? Where, are they, where is it spatially variable? And there are international organizations that do this, headed by the US, NOAA, the Europeans, etc. But regarding the third side, which is whether the land is sinking or uplifting, which magnifies the flooding, it wasn't the USGS, it wasn't NASA, it wasn't NOAA, it wasn't the Europeans, it was Cheryl Tay. Okay, a woman who walks down the corridor at EOS, very unassuming, but an absolute genius. She used INSAR satellites that went over the 50 largest cities every six days for six years. And you could identify which cities were sinking and by their velocity. Never been done before. These, the, the spatial resolution is amazing. You then can provide a map to a city and say, this area is sinking, this area isn't. It's how you allocate resources. It's amazing what we do. I shouldn't say we, because I didn't do anything. Right, okay, what else do we do? We, okay, so the other thing we do is we do lots of new technology. So these are called GNSS stations. We're setting them up. We've got two in Singapore that we've just installed. We're setting them up all around Southeast Asia. They uniquely measure what the land is doing. Because they're located near the ocean, they measure what the oceans are doing. They will provide, for the first time, real-time information on what's called relative sea level rise, what the land does and what the ocean does. And if you want to protect your shorelines for storm surges, flood heights, this is what you do. This graphic. This graphic um, is a paper by uh, Tim Shaw, uh, who's one of my graduate students. You got the QR code for the, all of these papers. One of the things, again, what does it EOS do? So one of the things that we're very aware of is that, yes, when you're at NTU and you're a student, you can go on to um, um, Nature Publishing Group, Communications Earth, and download it. But if you're working in a university, or not even working in a university in one of the developing nations, you haven't got the funding to do that. What EOS does is make sure that every one of our publications is freely available. We pay the open access fees. So what Tim did in this paper, it's a bit specific, um, but what's really interesting is that for the first time, we recorded what sea level was in Singapore. That's the present day, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, going back 22,000 years ago. 22,000 years ago, we were in the middle of an ice age. We were in the middle of an ice age, and sea levels were some 120 meters below present. Again, climate science isn't Again, it isn't rocket science. You lower global temperatures, your ice sheets grow and sea level falls. You raise global temperatures, your ice sheets melt and sea level rises. And then on the right-hand side are the rates of change. So in this paper, what we were trying to look at is when, if we look into the future, 2050 or 2100, and look at those rates of change, what were, when was the last time we experienced them? So can the geological record provide you with information of the impacts they can have on landforms? Or as this paper, this shows, can you hear this? 
what it has on people. You know, you, you, this university is amazing. There's so many wonderful academics. And I really, you know, really try and take advantage of that. That's what my team did. So we did our sea level rise, and then we worked with, um, we worked with High Lim, who was a geneticist faculty member, to try and understand how that influenced people and the amazing Asian genome that you have today is because sea level rise broke land bridges and isolated different populations around Southeast Asia. This component is all about trying to look at extremes. So we look at extremes of how you would combine together um, sea level rise with a storm surge. Storm surge driven by a tropical cyclone, or in the case on the left-hand side, a storm surge driven by a tsunami. Again, groundbreaking research. We wrote a paper that we came out in one of the Nature Journals last year, having a look for the first time. It's, you know, like this thing about being a centre of excellence... It's all about thinking about things like black swan events where you have a compound disaster where you have a tsunami and sea level rise or storm surges and sea level rise because that's what unfortunately can happen. Some of the work, so this is all about extremes again with sea level rise. What concerns me is that these ice sheets are incredibly unstable if they cross a tipping point. So if temperatures get beyond around 2 degrees C above pre-industrial, all Greenland and Antarctica will start to disintegrate. And it's very hard. These are these deep uncertainties, very, very hard to model. So how we sort of address this was actually doing what are called structured expert judgments, where we got the best scientists in the world to sit down, and instead of using models, we used our brains, and we tried to think about what are the upper ends of sea level rise that we can potentially experience, somewhere between 1.3 and 1.6 metres, 0 0.7 to 0 0.9, and then moving on into the future. Sea level rise, unfortunately, is locked in. It's a question of when those magnitudes will be reached. Sea level will rise one meter. It will rise two meters. It will rise five meters. In the end, it will rise around 10 meters. The question is when. Because we've set these wheels in motion. Will these catastrophic sea level rise occur this century? which we will not be able to adapt to, just simply can't, or will they occur in centuries to come, where you hope you have a better understanding of how to work with nature? And I'll keep going for another two minutes. This is the type of work that we really are invested in, in... EOS, which is really trying to apply our science. So this work led by David Lalamant is to work with the Asian Development Bank to try and have a look at the damages to coastal assets when a tropical cyclone occurs, the real damages, what occurs instantaneously and what will occur for decades to come. We tried to think about nature-based solutions. So we had a paper that came out in, um, came out in you shouldn't say in press, uh, we had it came out in Nature last week. Um, it's not a good paper to read. Um, I wouldn't suggest it for your bedtime reading. Uh, 
because it's really concerning. So here in Singapore, a lot of efforts put in to nature-based solutions. So we're thinking about, you know, the carbon stored by tropical rainforests or mangroves or corals and wetlands. And we're trying to promote the preservation. Um, you know, I was at a Tamasek board retreat um, last week. Um, where Ho Chin, the Prime Minister's wife, is the president, and they're talking about the investment of Tamasek in mangroves and tropical rainforests as being this golden ticket. And in many cases it is, because if you can promote the preservation of the natural world, it has so many benefits. Mangroves protect the shoreline from erosion. They filter drinking water. They're a biodiversity hotspot. Huge impacts on mental health. And importantly, they store carbon. However, they themselves have an ecological niche which is threatened by climate change. And in this paper, we stated that if you got to seven millimeters per year, we're already at four millimeters per year, you cross seven millimeters per year if you go beyond the tipping point of two degrees C, all the mangrove forests and all the coral reefs are extinct. They've got nowhere to go. So it's a really difficult paper to get published because people who are promoting nature-based solutions do not want to hear this because it indicates that investment in nature-based solutions is a bad investment. But we desperately need to control our emissions. So when I was, I'm going to finish with this, I think, and then you can ask me some questions. We do like our nice looking slides, don't we? We're very good at this. It's all, hey, hey, if you want to be a success in Singapore, it's all about image. It's what I learned very, very quickly. Yes, you have to be an expert, but you need to do it well. You know, if I was ever coaching assistant professors here, you have an amazing opportunity in Singapore because governments will listen to you, the agencies, a lot of the big firms have their corporate regional headquarters here. You have a huge ability to make the distance, but you better have an elevator speech ready. They ask you something, you need to be able to reply within 30 seconds exactly what you do and what you need the money for. Okay? So, EOS, when I became director of EOS, the first thing I thought was, right, let's look good. Let's show off what we do. Okay? And we do it quite well. Suits my image as well. I like looking good. Okay? We're producing all these scientists. We go to, you know, on sea level. So when we started, when I came to Singapore in 2017, there wasn't one single person studying sea level except me. It wasn't anyone. For an island nation subject to existential threats from sea level rise, now we have 40 people engaged on this project. That's what you can do here. You can't, like I still think, I've got to try and see whether the government will react on policy, but really in the scientific community, we went from, not, you know, in 2016, 17, if someone said, um, you know, where in Southeast Asia is there any sea level research? They would say that there's none. Now we're one of the global centers. That's what we're able to do. We do all this type of community engagement. We've got documentary films coming out on Antarctica. We send people over to the Arctic. It's one of my graduate students, Trina. We, we, develop relation, we developed a relationship with the Norwegian embassy. They were interested in sponsoring us. As a result of that, now NTU is signing an MOU with Tromso, which is the Arctic University. They're partners with us on all types of things. We just sent two graduate students on a Norwegian research vessel that circumnavigated the North Pole. First time 
It's what we're able to do here at NTU. Such a powerful university. And these two students, what are they studying? They're studying the release of methane in the Arctic Ocean. As the sea ice disintegrates, it warms up and trying to understand whether these methane releases are abnormal or not. Right, I'm going to finish there um, because, I mean, I could, as you can imagine, I can talk all day. Um, it drives people nuts, um, but I want to give you the opportunity to ask me some questions in the last um, 30 minutes or so. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for listening. Please ask me some questions. Okay, so we'll take questions from the crowd. And while we'll go for the first one when you raise your hands, maybe the first one I was asked um, uh, from the crowd was um, how do you cope with climate anxiety if you do experience it? But after this talk, I think it's a pretty relevant question. Well, climate anxiety, I, I, first of all, um, I wish we didn't as society have to deal with this that people are scared about what the environment will do. So when you give giving communication speeches, you can have to stress the urgency, you have to stress the impacts, but you have to give people hope that we can solve this crisis. And so that goes some way to elevating anxiety. Then you realize what works in other environments. It's um, well known that if you, as an individual, do something about the problem, your anxiety is reduced. So there's this classic study in the United States that the anxiety of school children is relieved if they do something about climate. So we took this on board. Again, this is what EOS does. Our community engagement office now works with MOE to try and calculate and lower the carbon footprints in schools. So school children can see that they're making a difference. There are 8 billion people on planet Earth. Every single one of them must become a climate activist. What that means is all personal. But governments predominantly will be too slow to react. Businesses will wait for legislation, regulation, and the market. But at individuals, you have huge power. And you need to be a climate activist. Every decision you make, you need to think about the environment. That may be very appropriate speaking to, to, to a group of students who've decided to spend their Monday afternoon listening to me. I may be preaching to the converted. But do you understand how urgent this is? We have six years and three months and counting. That's all you have left to solve this problem. Now you're going like, no, 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 no. No, this is a problem for you. No, no, we know about this. So the, we live in this fortunate time where policymakers can ask questions and scientists can give you the answer. So back in 2015 or 16, policymakers wanted to know when we needed to peak our emissions of carbon dioxide, peak them. Scientific community looked at inventories on carbon production and said we needed to peak it by 2030. We go beyond that, we aren't able to recover. We will shoot over the two degree C threshold and we pass all these tipping points. Tipping points where Antarctica dis disintegrates, Greenland disintegrates, permafrost melts, the ocean conveyor that takes heat from the tropics to the poles slows down. 99% of coral reefs become extinct. All these horrendous things happen. We've got six years and three months. It's, not, it's your generation, it's my generation that needs to solve that. So the question about anxiety is that we can solve it. We have to solve it. You have to become a climate activist. You have to make a difference to your lives then maybe you can start to solve this. But the other thing about anxiety is that that's not my profession. So asking me that question is difficult. 
I'm a climate scientist. I can tell you how high sea level will be, but I don't actually know how to solve it. But the climate program works with people who understand mental anxiety to existential threats. So we can now start to collaborate to provide a better answer to that question. There's been some talk about trying to store CO2 under the sea and depleted oil wells and so on. So what do you think the impact of such undersea storage of CO2 will have on the ocean as well as temperature and sea levels? So, I mean, you know, that's carbon capture and storage, um, thought of as a geoengineering solution to climate change. It's basically trying to catalyze um, a system that has worked in the earth for um, millions and billions of years of how CO2 is stored underground. It's a dangerous um, um, solution because it's not developed at scale. So if we look at the, the COP, I was introduced, at, you know, basically I did something on COP26. In COP26, the governments made their plans of how to reduce their carbon inventory. But they would not think about the source of the problem reducing the amount of greenhouse gases produced by petroleum. They said they were going to solve it through a technology that takes carbon dioxide under high pressure, under cold temperatures, converts it into liquid, and pumps it back into the ground. It's feasible, but it's not done at scale. So this is one of the problems that we deal with, is that we have to get to the problem, which is emissions. Emissions must come down. We cannot rely on a, te a technology that has not been developed at scale. It's just as simple as that, and the costs are astronomical. So its actual like environmental or ecological impact should be negligible because oil and natural gas has been stored underground for millions of years. So you should be able to re pump it back in, cap it, and it will stay there for a further million years. But it hasn't been done at scale. So it's a dangerous one. It's, for example, just like talking about net zero. Singapore's net zero plan is 2050, 2060. What does net zero mean? What does that actually mean? What are you actually going to do? Are you going to decrease your greenhouse gas emission, or are you hypothetically going to try and balance it through carbon capture and storage or nature-based solutions that if we don't stop our greenhouse gases, you've got to go after the source of the problem. It's very, very simple. We, I mean, I, you know, like... Oil, natural gas, and coal has been absolutely amazing at providing energy to the earth, perhaps the single greatest product for reducing child mortality, improving GDP. But we have to transition, and we have to transition rapidly. We can't let special interest groups determine your lives. Be aware of their rhetoric. You're all educated people. Net zero is garbage. We now have this argument that I, I saw the CEO of Shell talking about is that we need to keep on drilling because it keeps the lights on in the developing nations. Oh, come on. Absolute garbage. How can Shell make a profit of $32 trillion? There was a fact associated in that. If you were born at the same time as Jesus Christ and made $20 million per year to the present day, you wouldn't make as much money as Shell made in 2023. How much of that was put into renewable? BP. BP. Oh... I mean, they, they had this big program in the U.S. where they were on the adverts all the time about using algo, algae to develop renewable energy. Yeah, they cancelled that program after the adverts didn't work very well. Be careful of the rhetoric of special interest group. That's the problem with the market. Um, I said I wasn't going to... But, you know, while you maximise profit 
and the shakeholder uh, for, for uh, shareholders, we're going to really struggle to solve this problem. There are some really interesting ideas out there. There's this idea of donut economics, where you know the lower ring of the donut is increasing your profit, and the outer ring of the donut is planetary boundaries, and you keep yourself within that. Because the economic models that all the business firms were developed in the ninth, early part of the 20th century, where we didn't have an understanding of our finite research. Just be aware, like, you know, it's the biggest challenge facing society, and everything that we've tried before hasn't worked. What I've done as a profession has not worked. Hopefully, this new program, either C2 or the climate program, produces a new generation of scientists that understand how to communicate, to get policies to change rapidly. Everything has to change. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I've been involved in the last two assessments. Abject failure. You spent so much time on that, didn't achieve anything at all. Okay, all right, next question. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, actually, the, my question is related to what you just said. So you created a new initiative, but given all this experience that you had, what would you do differently and what, what worked and what didn't work? You know? So that's the question, thank you. <laughs> what would I do differently? Oh, I think when you, you know, uh, hindsight's amazing. I mean, every decision I made was always with the best intentions. Depends what, you know, depends how you're brought up, okay? Uh, you know, when I finished my undergraduate, I made some really good decisions, I think. When I finished my undergraduate, I went and worked for Coca-Cola Schweppes. I didn't want to be an academic. My dad was an academic. Don't want to do what my dad does. Okay, so I went and worked for Coca-Cola Schweppes on their graduate recruitment scheme. And after about two years of working there, I couldn't give a damn whether I was drinking a can of Pepsi or drinking a can of Coca-Cola. I didn't care about the product. So I made a decision um, to work in science. And then I made, I think, one of the things that's important is to, in, in life is to take all the opportunities you ha have. You have amazing opportunities at NTU, and then you follow your heart, what makes you a human being, and try to do what's best for other people, and that's what I've always tried to do. And sometimes it hasn't worked, you know, I do lots of opportunities and they don't work, and sometimes it does. You know, we've moved significantly in climate in terms of awareness. We now just need to do the next stage, where people are aware of it, but next stage is for people to want to take action before it's too late. You know, we can do amazing things, but, you know, climate change, how can we do it differently? I don't know because we don't have anything to compare it to. It is the big problem of the 21st century. Currently, we have this horrendous war in the Ukraine. Horrendous, devastating. But it's not the first time there's been a regional war. Afghanistan, Syria, Vietnam, Cambodia. We've had world wars, and we've recovered. We've just come out of a pandemic, but it wasn't the first pandemic. Yes, it was solved through the vaccine, but we'd had SARS, Ebola, Spanish flu, the Great Plague. We've never experienced climate change. So asking me what I would do differently, I don't know. I've just tried to follow my heart, tried to take opportunities, and right now, I just don't have enough hours in the day. So if I could do differently, I'd get a time machine and try and stop time so I can try and get my message out to more and more people. I think the key, I've been good at it but not good enough, is working with different people. I think that that would be the message that I would suggest to you guys. You know, you're at a, I keep saying it, world-class university. Take the advantage of all these different scientists. Explore it. And I think that that would be perhaps what I didn't do well enough, is I didn't talk to story. Climate's all about storytelling now. I didn't spend my time enough with social scientists to understand how to tell that story. It's a great question, though. I'm, I'm quite surprised, because I'm normally, like, I've normally heard the questions before. So, you know, I've got the carbon capture and storage. No, no offence, but I'd had that before, so I gave a really good answer. Your question... I'll think about that, okay? I'll think about that better. 
Yep. Uh, hi, um, I'm actually a PhD student here uh, coming from a different discipline. I came in with a very specific concern because I'm from China. Uh, my hometown is Tianjin. You probably realize that name. It's one of uh, uh, the, the, the city with the fastest sinking rate in this entire world. So uh, I'm of course worried about that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my question would be like at this current point is that um, uh, almost like irreversible, like uh, is it too late already? Or as a general uh, resident of this such a coastal city, like what would you suggest for us? Well, when you think about sea level rise, there are three solutions. Yeah? One is you stop the water coming in, build sea walls. The other is you live with the water, you allow the water in, you change your landscape, or three, you relocate. They're just three simple options. And so if you're provided with the best scientific information of what's happening to any individual city, you then can make a, a, a choice. We at EOS, we worked with some Fulbright scholars to look at what Singapore could be in the 21st century, looking at this difference between a utopian future and a dystopian future. Singapore, just like your hometown, will be influenced by sea level rise. The question is, is how are we going to live with it? Are we going to create structures here in Singapore that may have analogies with the Marina Bay Barrage here, which is multi-purpose. It gives us drinking water, it stops seawater, but it's also a recreational area. People fly kites, people, families spend their time there. In New York City, um, um, I've seen the developments. New York City's Democrat. So they've been investing money in New York City, in Manhattan, and in New Jersey, on the, on the other side, in, in Hoboken, on how they redevelop their waterfronts for the next storm surge. And they're amazing. They're community-driven. They have the advantage that water cools an environment. So when they get a heat wave, the idea is that the population will go into these beautiful coastal areas, be surrounded by water and cool. There's recreational areas, eating areas, and it's all part of a coastal defense. You wouldn't know it, but it is. So you can have these beautiful futures, but if we don't solve the problem of greenhouse gases and we have six years and three months and counting, then you have your dystopian future where everyone will have to relocate. And we all know the problems with human migration and political boundaries and relocation. One of the aspects that David Lalamont's working on at EOS is trying to find tipping points on sea level rise that cause humans to migrate. So you've got this. You solve the problem, you can have gradual sea level rise. It will occur, but you live with the water. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I'd like to uh, ask a question about this thing that is when you... Okay, so like when there's a volcanic eruption, like some particles will help cool the environment and some have been looking into using this as a means to combat global warming, like similar to the thing about putting carbon emissions into the oil beds, do you think it's very risky? And is this a feasible or great solution to it? Oh, yeah. Great question, okay? So, I mean, I like thinking about, I always, like, I don't ever want to dismiss any um, solution which is based around the, how the earth works. So carbon capture and storage is based on basically how oil and petroleum form. Nature-based solutions is based upon how nature. Now to do with volcanic eruptions, we know that if there are certain types of volcanic eruptions, they have to occur in the tropics, they have to have certain explosivity to get high into the atmosphere, they cool the climate. 
because they inject sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere and they, those particles act as a mirror for incoming solar radiation to rebound back into space. And so a classic example is the Mount Pinatobo eruption in the Philippines in 1991. The Mount Pinatobo eruption in 1991 caused a global cooling of around one and a half degrees, but it was short-lived. But therefore, there is a possible geoengineering solution where you put sulfur dioxide continuously into the upper atmosphere. That's what's dangerous about it. You can't just do it once. You've got to continuously do this. And does that therefore mean that there's an excuse for fossil fuel companies to continue burning because we're going to uh, eject um, sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. When you see proponents of this, they do not know what the ecological impacts are. Anyone who grew up in North America or Northwestern Europe in the 1980s and 1990s talked about acid rain. Put sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, you, if it gets into the lower atmosphere and mixes with water vapor, what do you cause? It's dangerous. It's a solution. We do not want to be thinking about that. Reduce the emissions. Yeah? It's a really good idea, but it really is the last resort to stop the sun coming into our Earth's surface and then have to do it continuously. You could never stop. Yeah? Uh, hi, Prof. Here. Over here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for your talk, and thank you for sharing what U.S. has been doing, whether it's the research, the scientific research, or your efforts to trying to influence policymakers. So as a, as a concerned citizen myself, I'm, I don't have much scientific background myself, and I'm not from ASE, and I'm certainly not from the public agencies, so I'm just wondering what are your suggestions for people like me, what we can do differently on a daily basis, to make, trying to make some positive impacts going forward during this journey? Well, climate change is going to be all about societal change. Yeah. You I mean, just think of examples of where society has responded to social movements, you know, gay marriage, apartheid. They were never solved by a government or a business. They were solved by everyday people. So as an individual, I've already stated this, become a climate activist. And that can mean whatever you want it to mean. That can mean, oh, well, I'm going to eat vegetarian tomorrow instead of red meat. That's being a climate activist. That means I'm going to take the MRT, not drive. That's being a climate activist. That means chaining yourself to the Ministry of Manpower's gates. Don't do that. You didn't hear that from me. Okay? No, but I mean, it's whatever you want it to be. But the big thing is about education. So you think about what do I do individually? What do I do with my friends? What do I do with my family? What do I do with my community? What do I do? So what, where, are, are you at a school here at NTU? So which school is that? Okay, so... Do you have a society within CE that's looking at the environment? Can you, you know, like, for example, this event. Is this event carbon neutral? Of course it's not. Create something within your school that all events are carbon neutral. You work, I mean, we try, de like, okay, so, NTU is ambitious. Reduce its emissions by 50% by 2035. We always think about what the um, legacy is of presidents of a university. Now, Bertel Anderson created many things, created the Asian School of the Environment. So, in my opinion, Subra Suresh's legacy as a president was that he stated that NTU would decrease its emissions by 50% by 2035. That's the most ambitious target of any research university that I know. So how is CE going to do that? Do you have a carbon tracker? You know, can you work out the carbon footprint for CE or your events and then try and reduce them? That's all about being an activist. Yeah? You want to be proud of being a student at NTU. You should be. You can say, well, I'm at a university where we've got the most ambitious plan to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I'm at a university that just built the Gaia building. Okay? 
carbon neutral building. It's a beautiful building. But the whole university. So you can, you can start something off individually, your friends, your family, your community, your business, and then your consumer choices and the power of your vote. Yeah? Write an editorial in the Straits Times. You know, you and your friends about how, well, you were really dis well, you were really disappointed that none of, well, so we've got this new prime minister, uh, president that everyone really likes. What's his opinion on climate? What's he going to do? It's non-political, so it should be perfect. Climate change, again, it's all about solving um, inequality. It's one of the few topics that China and the US are talking about. So surely our president's got views. That's what you can do. And you can make a big difference. Uh, is it not my time to talk? We have time for a last question. OK. Uh, OK, I'll ask my last question. I'll be the one who asks the last question. OK. So as somebody who has some background in uh, high school economics, the way I see it, the only true solution, like lo true long-term solution to climate change is to significantly decrease production. And the hard truth is that uh, to, okay, to solve climate change, that's going to like contradict other objectives like your stereotypical like increased GDP and so on. So, and like I think that's a big reason why you have like these big companies who lie about climate change because like the real solution is hard to swallow. So, what do you have to say about that? Like I know you, econo like you don't you're not an economics professor, but what's your opinion? I mean, you're exactly right. It's not simple. If it was, it'll have already been done. But we're a more, it's all about education and information. If you're a shareholder of some of the big petroleum companies, I mean, climate change, again, climate change, if you think about it, it can be solved readily, easily. There are only a certain number of companies that produce the maximum amount of carbon dioxide. A paper just came out in Nature which looked at how I think it's the 70 largest companies are do, doing at meeting the Paris Agreement, i.e. keeping us below those. And it basically, it's based on publicly available data, identifies those companies. So now you know the companies that are going towards it and the companies that are not. And then your consumer individual choice is you go to the companies that are doing something about it. You don't go and use your active mind in economics and work for those companies. You go, I don't want to work for those. I'm not going to put my talents. So you have a choice, and this will make people respond. There can be other things. A carbon tax would maybe make the market respond quicker, but that's hard to implement. Certainly a carbon tax that would meet scientific requirements. It's not easy, otherwise it would have been done. But it's too big a problem to just give up. It's all there. You can say that, um, yes, we'll rely on petroleum, but... As we look at the transition, our uptake of renewables is faster than any other technology in the history of civilization. Far greater than the uptake of coal, far faster than the uptake of oil or natural gas is renewables. The solutions are there. Um, you have to try everything. I mean, you know, like, um, what would surprise you to know is that I also do work for Chevron. So the second largest, historically, of emissions from petroleum, produced around 40% since the 1880s. And what do I work for them? I try and educate them on climate. So I meet with their CEOs every six or so months, give them an update on climate science, and basically try and tell them facts. And they're smart, educated people, and we look at pathways into the future, and they're very aware they need to change as soon as public opinion changes. But right now, it's not urgent. Ben, hi, do you have time for one more question? Of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here today. Um, so you, you haven't mentioned um, the impacts of these extreme uh, weather uh, events on food production. 
And I was just wondering if anybody at EOS is working on mapping, uh, you know, where soil is no longer, um, you know, viable to uh, farm any longer or some of the impacts. Um, I, I actually do a lot of grocery shopping. I like to cook here in Singapore, and I've noticed a difference. Um, we barely have any papayas anymore. We, we don't get any more um, mangoes from Thailand. I, I've definitely noticed a difference in, in our supply. Well, I mean, climate change. I mean, so again, if we think about like solving climate change, um, I talked about that you can look at the biggest producers you can also look at the biggest countries. It's, you know, the vast majority, 75% of emissions are within the G7 or the G8. Um, we also know that we're increasingly an urbanized. So it, to solve climate change, we need to solve what's happening in the cities. What has been overlooked is what happens in the rural communities a lot, looking at those impacts on food production. Um, I wrote that there was an article in The Guardian last week that I was involved in, where we worked with um, um, The Guardian's um, Southeast Asia, and we did a lot of reporting on changes in rice production in and around Southeast Asia over the last decade there's going to be significant impacts. And that's what I'm worried about this time next year, is that there's going to be large-scale droughts. In that report for COP26, the other thing that we did as EOS is that we calculate the area of Southeast Asia that will be subject to drought by the middle of this century. It's about 60% will be subject to drought in rural areas. That will have significant implications on rice production. So we can again, again this amazing thing about scientists, we can map the areas that will be influenced by drought. We supply that through the COP26 reports to governments. It's then up to them to try and become more resilient. So they're not surprised when there is a drought because it's coming. So they can think about water resources is different strains of rice to try and withstand that. You know, the scientific community on agriculture, I think, in some ways, may be a bit too confident because it solved the Green Revolution in the 1970s when there was a lot of doomsday from the scientific community about overpopulation and not being able to feed planet Earth, and then climate. Um, 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 ecologists, biodiversity people who specialize in photosynthesis understood how they could improve the crop yields by moving grains from different locations and the applications of fertilizers. So there may be a bit of overconfidence that we can work our way out of this, but this isn't an overpopulation problem. This is a climate change problem which will affect the temperature, precipitation, drought, and flooding in agricultural regions. We do have some people who work on that, um, but again, I mean, this is just a limitation. So Singapore has its 30 by 30 policy, but it doesn't think about climate change. We have a big food initiative here at NTU, but there's no element of climate change in that. It's not thought of as a problem. And again, I've, you know, I've only got so many hours in the day, and I can, you know, say to people in the food program saying, well, you need to think about this. You know, if we're going to do 30 by 30, again, one of these things about the climate transformation problem, I, like program, which is really unique, for the first time, we're going to try and make the vertical gardens carbon neutral. So we're going to try and promote enhanced rock weathering. These are the type of solutions that are out there. In northwestern Europe, they've realized that you can, again, this is again going back to sort of nature-based solutions that work, that we can try and use basalt um, and certain types of ground out rock on our soils, which provide fertilization and draw out carbon from the atmosphere. It's never been applied on rice farming. It's never been applied in a controlled environment of the tropics. We're going to do this in NTU, and it's never been implied on vertical gardening. So we could have a thing in Singapore where we've got 30 by 30, we've got this vertical gardening, we used enhanced rock weathering, and it doesn't cost us any carbon. That's innovation, that's a solution, and that only takes place here at NTU.
because we're a technological university who sometimes thinks about really big problems. So I like that question because that is a very positive note to finish on. Singapore wants to create 30% of homegrown produce, but we want to do this in an environmentally sustainable way, and NTU are looking into how this can be done. I like that. Thank you.